Hi everyone, we're here today with World Press Photo winner Alicia Casey and we're going to have a chat with her today. So Alicia, first off, congratulations. Thank you. How does it feel? It feels fantastic. It's, um, it's, a, real, it's, it's a real honour actually to be, to be acknowledged in this way. Um, I think most photographers do enter quite a lot of awards and for grants and, and photo but photographic awards and to be acknowledged in this way in such a public way and then be exhibited all around the world is it's such an honor so I'm really excited about it and I'm looking forward to going to um to Amsterdam in a couple of weeks as well to meet oh, nice. the other winners exactly so we all meet up in Amsterdam um, for a couple of days and we have all sorts of interesting things planned for that time and um that's the final that's for the actual ceremony as well which happens in Amsterdam so mm. it's a great feeling so tell us, what is the story behind your project, A Lost Place? Um, well, the series A Lost Place looks at the, well, it uses the, the, the forest fires. In Australia, we call them bushfires. Um, it uses the forest fires in Australia, which occurred during 2019 and 2020, as a backdrop to, to explore the connection between colonisation and the environmental catastrophe that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, Australia is a, is a particular environment, um, as, as you would know, where the bushfires ravaged the country in 2019 and 2020 um, and burnt a land mass around double the size of England. So if you can imagine the, the entire, this in, in, entirety of England mm. and again being burnt by the fires. So it is on an absolutely enormous scale. Um, and these fires happened in the area where my parents live um, and so at the time in 2019 I was in London um, in my kitchen when when my parents rang and told me that the fires were really close to their home and they had to evacuate and I was just filled with this incredible anxiety and dread about what was coming and about what was occurring um, and they evacuated they had to evacuate three times I think during the fire season um, which lasted about four months um, and during that time this this just a kind of un, unimaginable amount of wildlife was lost as well as land. Um, my parents were really lucky. The fires actually skipped over their, their, their small town where they lived and so they escaped completely unharmed. But of course, so many other people didn't. So many people lost their, their homes. Several people lost their lives as well, mm -hmm. their livelihoods. Um, and the, 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 um, the agriculture that was lost, the animals that were lost, was an absolute, absolute catastrophe. Um, one writer, um, his name is Richard Flanagan, wrote for the New York Times at the time that this is really, we should coin a new terminology for environmental destruction of this level, which is omnicide, meaning the killing of all things, because it was so drastic and absolutely horrific for the population. Um, of Australia, including including the populations in that area, but further afield as well, because of course the smoke travels and travels across the land as well. Yeah, um, I was filled with this this awful, awful anxiety being in London and not being able to get home at the time. I did think about going, but there was no point because what could I do? I couldn't do anything about it. Um, so actually, to ease my own anxiety and my horror at what was happening, I started to rework images that I had taken previously in Australia. So um, I've been a photographer for a long time, since I was about 15, so that's quite a long time. Oh yeah, oh, almost 30 years now. Um, and I've got a, a huge archive, obviously, of photographic work that I made in Australia. So I, um, I brought up some, I printed out some new landscapes that I'd made recently in Australia and started to brush onto them with inks and paints and oils and whatever else I had in the cupboard actually in this attempt to instill in them my, my emotional um, angst and my kind of outrage as well that this was happening, that this had been allowed to happen, mm -hmm. um, that politicians hadn't stepped in early because we knew that these bushfire seasons were coming, mm -hmm. that we haven't listened to, to Aboriginal voices who have been advocating for different land management for so long and it's not been listened to by, by Australian politicians. Um, and that this, this death on, on such a massive scale for the wildlife was happening as well as all of the land that we were losing. So I 
brushed onto these um, onto these prints, and then I carved through them. So it was really my way of of um, coming to terms with my own grief and what was happening in a place which I love so dearly, but which I can't, I couldn't be in, and I couldn't get to. Um, and so by producing this work, it kind of calmed me down, and it kind of allowed me to make sense of everything that was happening at that time. Um, and then the work just kind of flowed from there. I kept on producing it. I kept making it. And as I, as I went further into the idea, I started to understand the links between colonisation in Australia uh, in, in, in terms of environmental change, environmental, the environmental catastrophe that we're facing. Are so, it's so tightly linked to colonisation and the mistreatment of the land, of the people and of the animals. And so the series has continued to develop since 2019 when I originally started it. And I've now introduced animal species from mainly London-based museums, zoological museums, in particular the Grant Museum of Zoology, um, have been working with me. And I've been photographing their specimens, which were taken from Australia and brought back to the UK and have been archived in museum specimens in, in, in the UK. So I'm really exploring this link between the colonial, um, the colonial legacy and environmental and climate change. What camera kit, like, well, camera, lens, lenses, etc., did you use for uh, this project? I, I use everything, basically, yeah. but analog. I have a preference for analog, mm. um, mainly because there's a magic to it. I think there's still a magic to analog, which, of course, some people can get as well with digital. I mean, there's remarkable work in this exhibition alone. It's absolutely yeah. remarkable. The majority of it shot on digital, of course. But for me and the way I like to work, I mm. still prefer analog. I love the tactility of film. I li love the almost textural component of film. So all of the work in this series is photographed on film. Um, I use, mainly use a large format camera. So I use a really strange eight by, it's um, actually five and a half by eight inches camera. Mm -hmm. It's a very old camera that I bought initially yeah. a very long time ago. They used to be, used to be used to photograph fridges, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, oh. So <laughs> it's a really beautiful camera and I use it mm -hmm. now without a tripod. I use it on the ground, on a beach towel, on the ground, no light meter. Um, yeah. So I like to kind of defy some of the rules because actually I think it needs to be a really intuitive response to your environment. And so all of this work is, is made, all my work in general, is made intuitively. I don't pre-plan images. I don't kind of plan what I'm going to photograph. I, I mm. go into an environment and then I, I, I place the camera in there and I kind of walk around or I sit within that environment for some time kind of trying to get to know what the environment and understand what I want to photograph then. Um, so most of these images in this work is photographed on a large format um, camera, as I said, five and, five, and, five and a quarter by eight inches. It's a very strange, strange size, um, as well as four by five, um, large format as well, as well as the Mumia 7, um, mm. which is 120, of course. Um, and then once I have the films developed, I do all sorts of processes to the films. I mm -hmm. often paint onto the films, I often scratch through the films, um, or sometimes I sc scan them straight out, digitally print them, mm -hmm. and then manipulate the prints from there. Other times, I actually make the physical prints in the darkroom. Mm -hmm. For some of the work that you'll see, um, there are cicada wings, which I found on the beach in Australia. Mm -hmm. I found hundreds of cicada wings which had washed up after a really bad storm. Mm -hmm. And I found these, these wings and I pressed them within sheets of glass within the photographic enlarger, yeah. which makes a photogram, of course, underneath. So I made photograms and then I painted on top of that and then scratched through those photograms. So my, my kind of theory um, is that there's actually no rules for, my, for me in my photographic practice. I, I paint, I draw, I etch, I, I will use any kind of process because what it's about is about the emotional connection not about what kid I'm using, not about what lens I'm using. It's all about the output and that emotional connection between the viewer and the work. What has your journey been uh, like um, taking photos with large format? Have you always shot? Oh wait, oh, yeah. Have yeah. you always shot large format? No, I haven't always shot large format, but I, as I said earlier, I've always, I've always photographed with film. Mm. Um, I started with, a, with an old Canon AE-1, I think, when I was 14. Mm. Um, and then I progressed onto a, a Leica, which I still sometimes pick up, which is yeah. beautiful, of course, it's so beautiful. Um, and then into a Mumia, um, and then into the large format. 
and and for this for this series, I, I, I have used the Mamiya at times as well. So it's a, that does come into it, because at times you just simply it's just it's just completely impractical to bring a large mm -hmm. format, for example, to today on the tube to brought yeah. to have brought the large format in today. It's just so impractical in really crowded spaces, and it sometimes doesn't work. And 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 as we were speaking about earlier, it's really about the 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 emotion in the image. And so the actual hit doesn't matter as much as the emotional output. And so if I can make that work with a handheld, you know, 120 film, then medium format, then that's absolutely fine. It's just that I don't always feel I can. And one beautiful, many beautiful things about the large format, but one of the beautiful things is that it slows you down. And, and these days we're all so frantic. There is such a kind of frenzied energy, I think, in the world that actually to take a deep breath and slow down is mm -hmm. just wonderful. And that's when you really start to see things. Mm. Um, if I can give any advice to, to anyone, I think it's to put your phone down mm. and look out at the world and slow down because that's when you see things that you actually want to record and that you want to photograph and that you want to make images of. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, the large format kind of feeds into that creativity. It's not about that camera, but mm -hmm. that camera fits in in a lovely way to what I want to do and yeah. to the outcome, to the images that I want to produce. Um, I mean, it's not overly heavy, it's just a bit awkward to carry around. That's mm. the thing about large format. And sometimes when you are out, you think, gosh, why don't I just use my phone yeah. camera? <laughs> it's not always an easy task, especially changing film. That's yeah. the other problem, of course. I only have two dark slides usually when I go out, two or three, mm -hmm. um, because they're quite hard to get in this particular size that I have. So I have a couple of dark slides, which means I'm having to continually change the film either in a dark bag or come back to the dark room and change it, which, of course, is not great. But sometimes if I, if I don't have the dark bag with me, I'll only have four, four photographs to photograph in that one, in that one mm -hmm. shoot. Um, so that can be quite limiting. But actually, I think when you limit yourself, that's when you can really get creative and that's when you can really push the boundaries because we all need boundaries to kind of bounce and push against and then that creativity flows a lot more, I think. Yeah. Oh, next. Nice. Yeah, I think, I think I saw on your website that you said something about that it's more a reflective way of working. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And, and that's because it slows you down. So you've got time to reflect rather than reactive. So I would say probably if I was using a 35mm handheld camera, I would be more reactive to a situation, mm. which is often, um, you know, the, the way that photographers need to be in situations, particularly in conflict um, or in many situations. Portraiture, of course, you need to be reactive in that sense. Mm. But for me, because I'm not, I'm not in conflict zones, I'm not photographing in high-paced, high fast, um, you know, high, high energy environments, I can really slow down um, and therefore the large format comes into that in a really, really beautiful way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something about the process of then developing these films, mm -hmm. you know, you develop it and then you look at them and then sometimes you scan them or sometimes I edit, I actually physically scratch onto the, onto the, actual, the actual negatives. Mm -hmm. And there's just something beautiful about that physicality. Um, and I think that is something we're often lacking from the world as well, where everything is pushed back behind a screen. Mm -hmm. I think we want something physical often. We kind of crave, have a longing for, to hold something which is tangible and physical. Mm -hmm. And so the large format forms in, falls kind of into that as well, that it creates that actual physical product of that negative. All right. Alethea, thank you very much for speaking to us today. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, and like the video.